the Great Depression. Don't know if you can hear this. Here we go. So what were the causes of the Great Depression? Well, we already looked at the unsteady stock market. So speculation during the great 1920s, people buying stocks on loan money and on the margin, using stocks for collateral to buy more stocks led to an unsteady stock market as it begins to fall in um, late 1929. Brokers loans under $5 million in the mid-1928 by mid-September of 1929, brokers were loaning $850 million to people to buy stocks. You also had government and economic policies, which were laissez-faire, meaning hands-off policies, meaning that they weren't taking any action against these unwise investing practices. Farmers and consumers were buying on credit, and Congress passed some really high tariffs to try and protect industry and certain industries here in the United States so people couldn't export their goods um, or buy cheaper imports as well. You had an unstable economy where the wealth was not evenly distributed. You also had overproduction, particularly in p certain industries like the automobile industry as well as um, overproduction in the textile industry and in farm industries like wheat was sitting in train depots, rotting. In 1929, the stock market crash, Black Tuesday, um, lost $40 billion in paper values that day, um, $19 million worth of shares, or 19 million trades were completed that day. And as a result, the British began to raise their interest rates, which caused panic here at home, and people began to sell things off. You also had over farming, drought, and over grazing in the 1920s. The Depression actually hit the American farmer before it hit anybody else in the mid 1920s. There were these huge farm surpluses, um, and this led to price collapses, which meant that farmers needed to mortgage their homes to buy more tractors to be able to till more land in order to increase their yields, which led to more supply, which caused prices to fall. Ultimately, these foreclosures landed people at the farm auctions, as you can see up there in the upper right-hand side, people having their homes sold. So the impact of the stock market crash, um, you had 4 million workers that became jobless, 5,000 banks closed, and you saw these Hoover bills popping up as people lost their homes. They had no place to go, and they moved around the country seeking work. Um, these Hoover bills often popped up um, under overpasses and near train depots on the outskirts of towns as people came flooding into towns looking for more work. You also had a pretty large environmental disaster that coincided with this economic disaster, and this was the Dust Bowl. In the mid 1920s, like I said, people were plowing up more and more of the Great Plains in order to increase their crop yields. As a result of that, they ripped up native grasses, which caused um, more of this process called desertification, where the surrounding area basically turns to desert. The Great Plains are in a drought-prone area, and then you have a few years of desert, and what you get are huge dust storms. And here you can see um, the area of dust storms and they were huge clouds and they went for miles. As a result, people migrated out of the center of the Great Plains looking for new work. So what did Hoover do during the Great Depression? Well, he didn't last very long. For one, he was voted out of office by um, people seeking some significant change, but initially he kind of ignored it and he was a Republican laissez-faire um, type of business person and president and so and he did decide that he would start late in the depression with some public works projects and he initiated the Hoover Dam project he also created the construct reconstruction finance corporation which the idea behind that was that they would create pump priming loans they would loan money to banks which then would boost their economies and that would then trickle down to all of these other local governments, associations, railroads, other banks, etc. He also worked to getting the Norris LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act, which ant outlawed anti-union contracts and forbade federal courts from restraining strikes and picketing. But all of this was a little too late, and when you have the Bonus Army move into Washington based on a, a promise that had been made to them, things go 
all downhill for President Hoover. So the bonus army. In 1924, Congress, Congress promised World War I vets a bonus pension that would be paid to them in 1945. When the Depression hit, unemployed veterans wanted that money earlier. They wanted it a full almost, um, you know, 15 years or more earlier. 15,000 vets moved into Washington on the banks of the Potomac in 1932 to sort of protest and encourage and lobby Congress to give them their pension early. Anacostia, Anacostia Flats became the largest encampment. It was full of vets and their families living in shanty towns right across from the state capitol building. The Senate refused to pay the bonus army despite their peaceful protests. And here you can see the bonus army. They worked very cooperatively in their tent cities, feeding and, and organizing. They're cleaning themselves in the Potomac River. Um, the president sends in General Douglas MacArthur from the U.S. Army to clear out the camps. And at some point during this confrontation, shots are fired, tanks are brought in, and the U.S. Army charges in against these veterans um, with bayonets. It becomes a very violent outbreak between both the U.S. Army and Washington police. You can see here some fighting happening. And ultimately, the shanty towns were burned to the ground by General MacArthur, the Washington police, and the U.S. Army. So again, some more images from this time period. Here is an image of Anacostia Flats after it had been burned and cleared out. This made national news and got people pretty angry. Um, you hear a lot of songs and folk music being written at this time. Brother, can you spare a dime? Those sorts of things. A lot of Woody Guthrie songs. This land is your land. This land is my land. Um, come out of this time as everyone is really suffering. Some more Hoovervilles, shanty towns really very third world. Here you have men lined up for work, trying to find employment. You had a lot of soup kitchens that opened up and more and more people were flooding into these soup kitchens just to get some immediate relief. Bread lines. And it was called a depression not just because the economy depressed, but people became depressed. Divorce rates went up, um, you know, suicides rates went up, parents split up, sent their kids to live with relatives. It was really just a depressing time. Here you can see an employment agency and all of the men lined up to attempt to find work that just really didn't exist as the unemployment rate was very high. So people started migrating all over the country, moving into their automobiles, putting every single possession they could in their automobiles in an attempt to just move and find work. People were foreclosed on, which meant they had to sell their homes and all of their goods. You can see people living in their cars, migrant workers, shanty towns. This is more out west. You can see the snow levels. Dorothea Lang and, and Gordon Parks and several other photographers, including Ansel Adams, at this time were sent out and hired by the government to document um, with this new latest greatest photography um, what was really happening to American citizens as a result of the Great Depression. People in this time period, my grandparents generation worked really hard to reduce, reuse, and recycle and that's something that we talk about very often but we have no idea what it means compared to what they meant. It meant saving everything and using it until it was absolutely no longer usable and then finding a different use for it. Here you can see the Depression era unemployment rates and what percent of the labor force was unemployed. At its peak in 1938 and 39, the unemployment rate was right around 18%. So, Right now, we're running at around a 5% unemployment rate. Um, in late 1929, we're at a 3%, and you can see it just shot up as the Depression rippled through the economy. 
So Hoover then is up for election, and people literally called these shanty towns that they lived in Hoovervilles because they were dissatisfied with his reaction to the Great Depression. So in 1932, you have Herbert Hoover who's running against Democrat Franklin Roosevelt, and he actually um, kind of puts the end to a Republican era in the White House. FDR's campaign, he preached a new deal for the forgotten man, and his theme song was Happy Days Are Here Again to kind of get us out of that depression mindset. And you can see he overwhelmingly won the electoral vote with 472 electoral votes, and Hoover only had 59. It's a shift of the black vote also back to Democrats. The blacks in the South particularly had been voting for Republicans. Um, if you think about Southern Democrats or the folks who had passed Jim Crow. But nationally at this point, African Americans decide to get behind um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So sweeping changes are expected after March 4th, which was Inauguration Day. And you can see Congress holding out the reorganization broom to President-elect Roosevelt as Hoover is being shuffled out the door. Roosevelt's first inauguration, he said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR's reform um, and New Deal was based on the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. He called a special order of Congress to begin cranking out unprecedented amounts of legislation. And these are known as the alphabet agencies. And in his first hundred days, he tried to basically do anything he could to correct this Great Depression. And now we judge all presidents by what they accomplish in their first hundred days. Relief. You got the Unemployment Relief Act, the Federal Emergency Relief Act, which creates immediate relief for people and puts people immediately to work. It creates the Civilian Conservation Corps to employ 3 million men, the Works Progress Administration, which would create public works projects all over the nation. Um, a lot of dams, a lot of bridges were created as a, a part of the WPA. And then you had the Federal Emergency Relief Act, which actually would give people basically relief checks or essentially some form of welfare to get them through this early stages of the depression. You also had Congress pass the Homeowners Financing Refinancing Act, which allowed people to refinance their homes and stay in them. You had the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which established parity prices for basic commodities, and that meant that it gave it some real buying powers. It, established price supports. When the price of wheat, for example, tanked, it set a minimum amount that wheat would be sold for. The Civilian Conservation Corps was an organization mostly made up of young men who were sent out west to do things like um, plant trees in, in forest fire areas to actually put out forest fires. My grandfather was a part of the Civilian Conservation Corps, and I will show you some pictures of him in class. Um, to build trails, to build campgrounds, all of those things that you visit when you visit both national parks in the West and national forests and recreation areas in the West. Many of them were built by men in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Fighting forest fires, digging trails, just generally looking cute, um, and planting trees for soil conservation, building roads in wilderness, or not in wilderness, but in national forests and parks. You also had the Works Progress Administration, which worked to employ artists, as well as architecture, architects and photographers. So the Recovery Forum, the Re Emergency Banking Relief Act, invested the president with the power to regulate banking transaction. The National Industrial Recovery Act created the National Recovery Administration and the Public Works Administration, which were meant to help with industrial recovery and get um, people actually back to work. You had the Beer and Wine Revenue Act, legalizing wine and beer, and then later you have the 21st Amendment, which repeals prohibition. The other thing is we had a lot of people living in rural poverty still. So the idea was that we also needed to bring their standard of living up. And we could do this by electrifying rural America. And so you had the Tennessee Valley Authority and other 
national corporations who was to distribute and produce electricity primarily for these rural 